I just wonder what your thoughts are on um, the different disciplines and why some take it up more easily, why some don't, and what we can learn from that. Okay, so, yes, yeah, so, so there are clearly disciplinary differences and there are historical differences. Um, there, my personal view is that the differences are more historical than structural. Um, there is a sense in which more expensive areas, ones that require more physical infrastructure, um, end up um, being more competitive and more, um, and therefore more prone to this kind of scooping kind of behaviour. Um, what's interesting though is I don't think those, I don't think it's as clear as that. So where you have large, large scale public infrastructure, so protein crystal structures, classic case, um, as is genome sequences. Large scale public infrastructure that's been, that's driven a process of data availability. Um, and then you move into things like cell biology, um, particularly genotype phenotype association studies, incredibly competitive field, particularly problematic because it's very difficult. What you're looking for is an association between a phenotype and a genotype. And they're very difficult to find but if you know what to look for, they're very easy to show. Um, and so there are, there are those particular cases where there's a, there are structural reasons why you might expect there to be issues with um, scooping data. Um, data protection's the wrong word, but people being protective of their data. Um, and I think there's, you can draw some conclusions about how the different fields work. I, I suspect the, diff the, the, co the comparing physics with biology, I think, is the wrong way to put it. I think the differences there are actually historical. Um, and they have to do with the fact that there was a preprint culture in physics and maths that hasn't ever existed in the biological sciences, where we have a... And then there's the computer sciences, where you have a conference culture, which again is the communication cultures are different, and that's what's driven the changes. I, the differences between different areas of biological science, I think, are much more informative. So particularly in areas like, again, I, I'll pick on the cell biologists and the genotype phenotype people. Um, they are absolutely dependent on the free availability of genomic information, genetic information, yet they will not make their own data available. Um, and it's a very competitive field with high costs um, and high risks. So if I go back to you know, the issue of career structures, I, I know it's a, slightly, it's a slightly provocative way of viewing it, but actually I don't think that those researchers, those senior researchers are protecting the postdocs. They're protecting themselves. And I would say that because the problem is that they're protecting the one postdoc out of 10 who actually gets the Nature paper because the scooping is happening anyway because other people are working on exactly the same systems. The scooping is not a result of people stealing data. It's a result of people not putting out the fact that they've found something early enough to make the claim. And, and it's also a, a result of people, in some cases, delaying publication through a very slow and traditional publication thing. So you've got who gets first publication when they're ref refereeing each other's papers becomes an issue. But I think there's a serious question to ask, which is, are you protecting the one postdoc, the one student out of five or ten that are actually going to get the paper that's going to give them a career versus actually getting more of the other students' names on more papers that are probably not equally high prestige, but may in fact get the science done faster. So it's a, this is more of a structural problem with a career structure in science than anything else. Um, you know, we have a pyramid scheme, and pretending that that's not the case is, is doing disservice to the students and postdocs who end up not making it through that pyramid scheme. Um, and we can talk all we like about alternate careers, but the PIs who are shaping those careers don't regard those other careers as particularly interesting, particularly valuable. Um, so I think we have to ask a question about when we're training people versus when we're giving them a career. Those, those two things are clearly intention. 
And I think we have to ask questions about whether we um, are working to make sure that students get a students and postdocs get a, a good portfolio of solid papers with high probability versus high high very high prestige at um, with very high risk. And from the PI's perspective, these papers don't matter. It's only the ones at the top, and then it's a numbers game. Yeah, you need the 10 postdocs, because only one of them's going to get it. Because these other 10 groups are going to beat you to the other 10 papers. Um, so, which is not to say that people aren't concerned about, you know, aren't concerned about the people under their, under their wings. So I think those are, those are genuine concerns. But I think we need to rethink what it is we're protecting them from and what it is we're training them for. Um, um, and those are much more difficult questions than just about publication. They've got fundamentally go to the heart of how we manage um, the research community. I think the other thing is that if you're looking at a person, I, this, is, this is a real conflict for me at the moment. Three, four years ago, I would have said, as a PhD student or a postdoc, you shouldn't be pushing down this angle because it's you're too far ahead of the mainstream and the risks are high. It's fine for me, I've got a permanent job. Um, now it's less clear. Now a, a subset of the people who really push on this are going to be able to differentiate themselves from the crowd by doing it. Not all of them, and not all of them will be successful, and they'll still have to be conventionally successful. But there's, you could, there's a point that is either past or is just coming where the people who are coming in now and get themselves ahead of the curve will be able to take advantage of it. And I don't know how to pick that, and I wouldn't want to be advising people on how to pick it. But I think it's a, it's a real issue that we have to be training people for the jobs they're going to be applying for in five or ten years' time, and the world that's going to be there then, not the world that we remember from when we were applying for jobs five or ten years ago, which is just not there anymore. <laughs>